Are all families that scapegoat a narcissistic family system? That's what I'll be talking about in today's episode of Beyond Family Scapegoating Abuse. So stick around. Welcome to my channel. I'm Rebecca Mandeville, licensed psychotherapist, certified clinical trauma professional, and author of Rejected, Shamed, and Blamed. And today I'd like to talk about the narcissistic family versus the dysfunctional family. And is there a difference? Well, first of all, all narcissistic families are dysfunctional but not all dysfunctional families would actually qualify as having a narcissistic family structure. And that is why I say often in my articles and videos that any type of dysfunctional family can scapegoat. And that in the field of family systems, which is the field I've worked in for nearly 20 years, I've taught graduate courses also in family systems, we know that many types of dysfunctional families can have a targeted family member who is taking on that family scapegoating narrative. Uh, sometimes this is a result of what's known as the family projective identification process. Um, it, this is a pathological process. I liken it to being similar to a shared psychosis and I have uh, talked about this in some older videos of mine um, from three or four months back, and I'll be talking about it some more today. I'll also be talking about the narcissistic family structure and how in the family uh, systems field, we identify a narcissistic family system. This doesn't mean that the scapegoating's any less uh, abusive, but it can be driven by a different force within the family. Um, often the family scapegoating in a dysfunctional family system is driven by this pathological family projective identification process. And in a narcissistic family system, that identification, uh, projective identification process may also be at play but sometimes what is at play is the family is controlled by a strong narcissist, someone with high narcissism. Narcissism exists on a spectrum. It, it is not an either or. It is degrees of narcissism uh, at the pinnacle being um, malignant narcissism or narcissism that has sociopathic elements. Um, to low narcissism. And with that said, there are still signs that we in the family systems field have learned to be attuned to, to be able to identify whether a family system is narcissistic. And when I'm looking at scapegoating behaviors, is it driven by a family power holder with high narcissism who has created this false narrative, the scapegoat narrative? Or am I working with a highly traumatized, dysfunctional family where there might be intergenerational trauma? And those are the types of families in which the family projective identification process may be strongly influencing the scapegoating behaviors and the targeting of, uh, in particular, the family empath. Uh, this was revealed in my research that I've done on what I named family scapegoating abuse or FSA, the family empath is often the target of this pathological family projective identification process. In a narcissistic family system, I know that I am dealing with a family power holder who may be uh, quite conscious of the way they're treating the scapegoated family member. And the abuse can be quite conscious and intentional. And what seems to happen here at my channel is people um, come to one of my videos, they don't read the video description, 
Um, they don't read my pinned comment. They start watching and they, I'm, I'm talking about the dysfunctional family system and the family projective identification process and how this is in a way a shared psychosis and it is not always um, conscious and intentional, the behaviors, because the projective identification process itself is an unconscious process. It's an unconscious defense mechanism to keep anxiety at bay and families with um, a high degree of trauma and intergenerational trauma that is not recognized and addressed unconsciously are holding a tremendous amount of anxiety and this anxiety is released in part by othering a family member. That's very different than in a narcissistic family system where there is a family power holder that is very threatened by anyone challenging their control in the family. And that truth-telling child in a family system like this will become a target because they are a direct threat to the family member who is holding the most power in that system. And this will be the narcissistic uh, family member, the family member with the high narcissistic traits or full-blown narcissistic personality disorder, which is unlikely to ever get formally diagnosed because uh, narcissists do not enter a therapist room willingly. <laughs> and, and when they're there, uh, typically will will do all they can to charm the therapist. And if that doesn't work, they'll become enraged and stomp out of the room. And I've had that happen to me more than once um, because they cannot tolerate having their power challenged. So the narcissistic family structure is a structure, no doubt, many of you are already familiar with if you've watched any number of the many, many, many videos out on YouTube and elsewhere that talk about the narcissistic family system. Um, and this would include uh, the narcissistic enabler, which often can be the spouse sometimes um, an elder sibling who may have been made the parentified child or a substitute spouse. There will be the golden child, the very favored sibling who seems to get all the rewards and benefits in the narcissistic family system. And the scapegoat is the one that receives the uh, burden of having this split parts of this narcissistic family system projected onto them. When I talk about split parts, I'm talking about individuals whose psyches are not integrated. And through trauma, including with a narcissist, we know narcissism is created most times by early childhood trauma. So there is a divide within the psyche and the parts that the narcissist cannot um, identify with, the, the dark shadow parts, the fact that they're human and flawed, gets projected out onto the scapegoated child. That doesn't mean there's necessarily the family projective identification process going on. The scapegoating could be driven for the most part solely by the narcissistic family member, typically the parent. And the siblings and spouse are, are going along with the scapegoating and with the false scapegoat narrative to stay in the good graces of the narcissist to maintain favor of the, the king or queen, so to speak. And that's not necessarily including the whole family in this, uh, what's similar to a shared psychosis that can go on in highly traumatized, dysfunctional families with intergenerational trauma. And I realize this can seem confusing. Uh, initially, I'm hoping people hang in with me and keep watching my videos 
so I can help you understand family systems dynamics, how a narcissistic family is different than a dysfunctional family. And by no means does this mean people get a free pass if something's unconscious or they were traumatized when they were young or they're split in their psyche. I'm not saying the abuse is ever okay. And I always say you must protect yourself from abuse. But given I've worked with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people now in my 20 plus year career, I know that when my clients start to get psychoeducated as to what I'm picking up about their family system structure, and I can um, invite them to look at in what ways their family was dysfunctional and how did the scapegoating come out of that? Or what ways was the family narcissistic and what was coming out of that? It gives them some relief. I see this time and time again as they start to understand what was going on in their family system, how, in my opinion, this, this family scapegoating might have landed on them, been projected on them or been directed at them uh, intentionally in the, in, in the case of a narcissistic parent. And it really helps with their healing process. It really uh, gives them some forward momentum as they start to get educated and understand family systems. What I'm seeing is that every family that scapegoats, it's being assumed that they're narcissistic family um, in their structure. And so I have to, I have to um, say that that's not how it is. <laughs> it's as simple as that. We can't discount a half a century of research that has been done in the family systems field. So, I do think it's important people start to get some sense of what kind of family system did I come from? Was there a lot of intergenerational trauma that our family had never dealt with? Was there a strong narcissist heading up the family, maybe generation after generation? Does every generation seem to have a golden child and a scapegoat? That always can give you a clue. Um, it, it, you become a bit of a detective, an investigator, and it depersonalizes it a bit. It makes it easier to disidentify from that false scapegoat narrative when you can step back and, and look at the family in an objective manner. And sometimes um, I have people do actual genograms where we lay out three, four generations and look at um, psycho-emotional behaviors, issues, traumatic events. And you get to take some space from it and say, oh, okay, this is what might have been happening in my family. And this is how it came to be that I was the one that was put in that scapegoat role. As I mentioned earlier, a narcissistic family system is, of course, dysfunctional and shares many traits with all types of dysfunctional family systems, including the alcoholic family system. And that would be um, the unspoken rules of don't talk, don't trust, don't feel. There's no direct communication. All dysfunctional families, including narcissistic ones, are closed systems versus being open, healthy systems that can take in new information, learn, uh, and be open um, in regard to discussing issues, challenges within the family. Um, in all types of dysfunctional family systems, including narcissistic ones, there will not be clear boundaries. And there can be um, control issues. But when I see a family that has one person who seems to have all the control. I know I may be looking at a narcissistic family system. When I see a family where appearances are everything, I know I may be looking at a narcissistic family system. Uh, when I see uh, evidence that there might be actually a covert narcissistic parent, which I covered in a video two weeks ago when um, I, I released the video on the narcissistic martyr parent ploy. Um, sometimes both parents can be covert narcissists. Um, these things have to be 
sussed out over time as I'm working with a client and hearing about typical events that went on in their family, kind of get a feel and a sense for dynamics and what was going on in a given client's family system. Uh, when I hear a client tell me that a parent was very, very competitive with them, I know I may be looking at a narcissistic family system. With a dysfunctional family system where there is um, scapegoating going on, I know that it may be the result of the family projective identification process when I start learning about traumatic events in a given family, um, sometimes going back generation after generation after generation when I have people do their genograms. And these parents may not um, display high narcissism. Uh, there could be a parent that's very, very depressed, who uh, is not able to rise up to the task of parenting. They may have trauma from their childhood or sexual abuse from their childhood that's not ever been dealt with. They may have never seen a therapist. They may not know that they're even suffering from something in their past that traumatized their psyche. There's all kinds of reasons families become dysfunctional, but these things we tune into as family systems therapists to sort out what was happening in this family? How was it that my client ended up in that scapegoat role? Is there a narcissist in this family that is getting pleasure out of deliberately torturing my client in terms of the scapegoating behaviors? Is there an element of sadism going on? Could the parent have some sociopathic features, you know, pathological behaviors? What really gives me a, a big clue about whether the family projective identification process is going on is when you can tell that the siblings really, really believe these things about you. They're not pretending they believe it, that, which is what might happen in a narcissistic family system. Okay, I'm going to go along with this false narrative to stay in good with my narcissistic parent. But when you can tell kind of in a moment of horror, oh my gosh, my siblings really believe this stuff about me. That's a real hard one and can be traumatizing in and of itself. But that also lets me know as a family systems therapist that that family projective identification process, that shared delusional dance, <laughs> the, um, the distorted reality that everyone's bought into it, it, that is a, a big, big clue to me that I'm probably looking at a dysfunctional family with intergenerational trauma. And I'm going to be psychoeducating my client from that type of family a bit differently than when it seems they're coming from a narcissistic family system. In terms of protecting oneself from abuse, in terms of whether no contact, light contact, gray rock, all those things may be necessary. What kind of family they came from, that's not going to determine what I'm going to be inviting my client to look at because in whether dysfunctional family or narcissistic family or alcoholic family system, abuse is abuse is abuse, I always say, and doesn't matter if it's conscious, intentional, not conscious, intentional, they believe it or they don't believe it. I need to help my client protect themselves from further abuse. So this is uh, a topic I have covered in pa past videos, and I do have an article on the narcissistic family system and how that system is structured. I have an article that talks about highly traumatized families where the family projective identification process is at work. And I'm going to put both of those articles in the pinned comment on this video and in the video description. And I hope you take a minute to read both articles so you can start to get a sense for what type of family system you may have come from and what was fueling the scapegoating abuse, the family scapegoating abuse. That doesn't solve your problem, 
But psychoeducation can have a bigger impact on you than you might think, because I see it every day in my clinical practice and in my coaching practice, working with scapegoated adults, when they get these lights, these aha moments and start to see, stand back and see their family and, and what's been happening in their family sometimes for generations, it does contribute to the healing process. And yes, there is healing that is going to have to happen because most times you're going to have some trauma, complex trauma, betrayal trauma, attachment trauma, uh, a video that I did last week in um, a traumatized, uh, traumatized uh, invalidation. And what I'm calling family scapegoating trauma, which I'm currently researching on, and I'll be talking about family scapegoating trauma which is a result of family scapegoating abuse. It's a unique kind of trauma, in my opinion, and just like family scapegoating abuse, it deserves its own name. If you got something out of this video, I hope you'll take a second to click the thumbs up so you'll see more videos of mine on your home feed and take a minute to also subscribe. Let other people know about my channel if you find this sort of psychoeducation to be helpful. And I will be looking forward to seeing you next week.